Good afternoon and good evening uh, to, our, uh, to our audience. Welcome to today's uh, panel on uh, the Afghanistan conundrum and how it affects the Gulf. Uh, we have, uh, a lot has happened in Afghanistan. A, the Taliban have taken power once more in Ka uh, Kabul, which creates a new challenge for the Gulf states. Afghanistan, and the uh, Gulf states have had a very intimate relationship, not always to the, be uh, to the benefit of either side uh, for the last 40 years. With the United States gone now, the Gulf states have to uh, look at what is their, uh, re uh, their relationship going to be. With the rise of radicals to power in Kabul, the debacle of the American adventure, concerns about the region's security, uh, and the spillover of instability into the Gulf region, uh, we uh, and evidence that the Taliban have not proven to anyone yet that they have broken ties with various jihadist organizations like Al Qaeda. Uh, while Iran's history and geography makes the rise of Taliban to power especially worrisome to the country's leadership, Tehran has uh, displayed a great deal of flexibility in dealing with the group in recent years. Perhaps they anticipated a Taliban victory. For each of the other Gulf, uh, Gulf states has maintained different policies, interests, and levels of contact with the group. Doha hosted a Taliban representation office for over a decade based on the U.S. request to facilitate talks between Washington and the group. Now the Qataris are leveraging their years of interaction with the uh, Taliban and have uh, to facilitate communications and have actually scored a bit of a very serious PR victory in uh, helping to evacuate uh, people from, uh, from the region. On the other hand, the UAE and Saudi Arabia had kept the distance, irregular communications with the new rulers in uh, Kabul, and they are going to have to start uh, reevaluating their position. Uh, where do we think this is all going? How do we expect the Taliban uh, to uh, relate with the Gulf states, as well as the rest of Afghanistan's neighbors. Uh, which Gulf states will feel, the, will feel an impact of the Taliban victory? Well, which Gulf states will use Afghanistan as, or will they use Afghanistan as a battlefield for their rivalries, or will they cooperate? Today, we've brought you a rather, dis a very distinguished panel, uh, including people with firsthand experience of what has been going on in Afghanistan uh, for this period of time. I will introduce each of the panelists as we, uh, as they speak. Uh, one change, uh, Muska Bataskir uh, took ill uh, this morning and uh, Professor Obeidullah Bahir, who is a professor at the American University of Afghanistan, uh, has graciously accepted to step into uh, her, uh, her shoes. Uh, the Professor uh, Bahir is a lecturer of transitional justice at the American University. He holds a postgraduate degree in international relations from the University of New South Wales, where he majored in peace and negotiations. He is certainly going to have his work cut out for him over the next couple of years. Uh, Professor uh, Bahir, welcome to our program. Hello. Thank you for having me. Do you want me to start? Please, yes. Okay, first off, disclaimer, I'm definitely not wearing Muska's shoes. I'm wearing my own shoes. Um, that being said, um, little did I know when I was doing my own postgraduate research um, based on the structural and ideational factors hindering negotiations with the Taliban. Um, and when I was teaching transitional justice, um, as to how quickly Afghanistan would change um, and how important the process of transition and reconciliation is going to become. If we look at LIDARC um, and, and study the importance of um, conflict transformation and the ability to see conflict as an opportunity um, of starting a new society, starting all over without the faults of 
the previous regime. So post-conflict societies offer a lot of opportunities, not only for the people inside the country, but also for those who have stakes within the country. And especially the Gulf states have always had stakes within Afghanistan. They have, even when they've chosen to turn their back on the country, um, been directly or indirectly affected um, by the country's security situation. We have the example of Saudi Arabia being one of the primary you know, sponsors of the uh, Afghan Jihad when they later um, turned their back or chose to ignore the Afghan situation were um, punished by having groups like Al-Qaeda eventually aiming at destabilizing or getting back at the, uh, at the country and at the kingdom. There is a unique opportunity here, especially if we talk about the Gulf states in Afghanistan. And uh, that is the difficult situation that Iran is in. And not that I preach any alignment wars or proxy wars within Afghanistan, but Afghanistan is in a dire situation and we really need all the help we can get. And that happens um, when countries who have previously thought that the Iranian influence was too much to challenge, they should realize that the rise of the Taliban, who have traditionally had very good ties with Gulf countries, um, has led them to uh, conduct themselves in a way which has um, triggered, for lack of a better word, Iran. Um, and we see Iran taking a step back compared to the celebratory mood that they were initially in. Um, that being said, I thought that it would be really useful if we set a context for the situation in Afghanistan, and I being one of the speakers who um, is from the country. Um, most of us have read the UN reports about how 97% of Afghanistan's population is very soon going to be under the poverty line sometime next year. We are already seeing that if you go out into the bazaars, women are selling their jewelry, people are selling their furniture. There is no cash flow in the country. One cannot access their own funds within the banks with a $200 limit weekly for you to be able to extract. And you would think that the Afghans fought common communism and socialism for so many years that we wouldn't end up in a very socialistic setting that we are in right now. So it doesn't matter how much you have in your bank, you're just going to get $200. But beyond that, our, um, our issues do not end there. Um, the other major issues that Afghanistan is facing is the absence of governance skills. And the whole approach that was conducted by the Taliban of dividing ministries and important government positions, technical positions, and which required technocrats were divided as spoils of war amongst the different uh, commanders of splinter cells that were fighting towards the cause of conquering Afghanistan for the Taliban. And the way the previous regime left uh, with its peak of corruption, it um, led to the fall or implosion of all the institutions, their disintegration. Now, we also have to remember that President Ashraf Ghani had created an extremely centralized form of government where development um, and other all major uh, um, aspects or work of the government was functions were being conducted by specific offices in the presidential palace. That meant that the institutional memory or all the base that was built within the ministries was taken away from them. Now to restart with all of that, we would take some time. And lastly, we have the critical issue of recognition. This is something that the Gulf states and your other speakers would discuss with regards to how that is a dilemma that the rest of the world and especially the Gulf states would be stuck in. One of the major fears of us as Afghans is the possible civil war that is to come. And that means that um, the Taliban have an opportunity, but there is also um, threats to their own existence. There are specific actions that might end up being their own undoing. And... Um, if the dissatisfaction or grievance of the general population reach a certain level, the regional players could start investing in alternatives to the Taliban. And that would necessarily mean another insurgency, another civil war. This is in a situation where the Afghan army with 350,000 armed troops 
could not uh, manage to sustain the insurgency or hold them off. So the Taliban regime would have much worse um, chances if such a civil war were to break. But all of that context being said, we have to understand that the Afghan people are in the front lines. They are being used currently as human shields. So anything the international community does with regards to how it wants to move with, with regards to the human shield, um, with regards to their humanitarian aid for Afghanistan, is going to directly affect the Afghan people. Uh, we do understand that the Gulf states and other international players are worried that any financial funding that is given to Afghanistan is going to um, be used by the Taliban in means that could undermine international rules and laws. Um, that is where countries like Qatar, as the ambassador mentioned, can play the role of mediators. Um, the Taliban can be in charge of on-the-ground distribution, whereas the Qatar regime can help um, channel the funds and uh, change it into actual commodities uh, that would be distributed within Afghanistan. One of the major challenges, and this is something that I am already working on, where we are starting to morph into uh, from political activism to social welfare, because that is something urgently needed. And again, the space for political activism is limited. We really need uh, commodities as well because we can get the money from abroad, but we don't have enough to buy within Afghanistan to distribute as well. Um, so there has to be a channeling of goods. Um, and that responsibility should not solely lie on Qatar as well. Um, just short of international recognition, there can be a discussion about um, an understanding with the Taliban where financial aid is sent into Afghanistan. It doesn't necessarily have to be given to the regime itself. It can be given to civil societies. Now, this represents a major opportunity where it, it would help um, in creating a relationship between the civil societies in Afghanistan and the Taliban um, by making sure that the civil society has the funds the Taliban are forced to recognize them and, and really have a dialogue which is at the core of the issue right now in Afghanistan, where there are two very different worlds that have come together in the urban centers, and there is a complete absence of a dialogue because the Taliban have had an absolute victory, and they're trying to project their own vision on Afghanistan. That is problematic because when there are two very different visions of the world, even if I accept the argument that the urban population is much lesser than the uh, rural population of Afghanistan, if any party tries to impose its vision or lifestyle on the rest of the country, even if a minority, it is not going to be a sustainable model. Uh, so in short, um, the priority right now is humanitarian aid. It's emergency aid. Afghanistan does not have what is required. So we will not only need financial aid. We would also require the commodities um, uh, to be sent into the country. We need Qatar to play a mediator's role. We need Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf countries to really financially invest um, in Afghanistan uh, and its aid project. Um, we don't expect them to take much of the refugees or the asylum seekers because that is not something that they have been traditionally okay with, um, but they can help uh, and send this money to the civil societies within Afghanistan and uh, by that indirectly create uh, a dependency between the Taliban um, and the civil societies and hopefully that can open doors for a dialogue and for a discussion. Um, and in the long run, we can hope to ride off this wave. The Taliban are a reality. We can shut our eyes. We can bury our head in the sand. Um, and the sooner we get past the urgent crisis that is to come, um, the better for Afghanistan, the better for the region, because as you said, there's always going to be a spillover effect. So unless this vicious cycle of hunger and the absence of basic necessities and violence isn't ended in Afghanistan, it will keep haunting the region for decades to come. Thank you for having me. That is certainly not a viewpoint that is going to be easy to sell in the United States and elsewhere in the Western world. 
but it, it, it sounds extremely realistic from my point of view. Uh, next, we have uh, uh, Samuel Romani uh, the, uh, talking about the GCC states and perception of the, uh, of the, uh, of the new uh, regime in Kabul. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having a problem here with my, okay. Uh, Samuel is a tutor of politics, international relations, at the University of Oxford, received his uh, doctorate in March 2021. I'm going to have to start referring to you as Dr. Romani, geopolitical commentator, extensively uh, uh, published in foreign policy, American newspapers and magazines, and L monitors. Uh, as well as a lot of international uh, uh, media. Samuel has briefed the NATO Intelligence Fusion Center and the U.S. Department of State on developments in Afghanistan. Uh, Samuel, please. Great. Yeah, thank you so much, Ambassador Theros, for your kind introduction and for the excellent uh, previous presentation. So I want to make a few brief remarks today about how the Gulf countries view the situation in Afghanistan are they in competition with each other? Or are there sources of cooperation? Because that was something that was also asked to speak about by NS. And also, what, where are things going to go from here? So first of all, I want to emphasize the fact that there really is no single response from the Gulf countries towards the situation in Afghanistan. I think that you can classify the responses of these countries broadly into two categories. So you have Iran and you have uh, Qatar on the one hand, which have sought to engagement without recognition. So they thought to accommodate the Taliban's takeover, but they're not recognizing the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan anytime soon. The remaining countries have been largely spectators, waiting and seeing and trying to uh, react to developments on the ground while participating actively in evacuations and humanitarian assistance. So that sums up the views of Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Kuwait, Oman, uh, though the Saudis and the Emiratis seem to have had a slightly higher profile on the evacuation front and on some of these issues than the, uh, the, than the Omanis have. That would, uh, but I think that even though their roles and their views of the Afghanistan crisis are quite different, there seems to be a general consensus that there's going to be no recognition anytime soon. And that's part of a broader problem for the new Islamic Emirate, is that there's really no country that's really willing to take that first mover step and recognize the new regime. Russia doesn't want to do it because they're designated them as terrorists. China's got the concern about the East Turkestan Islamic movement. Pakistan certainly doesn't want to be the first. It wants to wait and see how others go. Have those three major regional powers and great powers are not necessarily wanting to do it. The Gulf countries certainly are not going to supersede them. So that is just a general trend. So uh, engagement without recognition seems to be the name of the game with regards to Gulf state involvement in Afghanistan. So now turning to the issue of competition. I don't necessarily think that Afghanistan will be a classic theater of intra-Gulf competition or Saudi-Iranian competition like we've seen in other regions. So, for example, it's not going to look a lot like Libya, where you see the Emiratis and the Qataris duking it out in some kind of a proxy rivalry, or what we've been seeing in the Horn of Africa, like Somalia, or like the Sahel. Instead, I think we'll be looking more at secondary competition outside of Afghanistan's borders is going to be where it's going to be more pronounced. So there's going to be a competition to some degree with regards to the supply of humanitarian aid and uh, assistance to, towards Western policies. So Qatar got a big advantage, obviously, with the securing of Kabul airport and also with its indispensable role in the evacuations. UAE also played an important role in those evacuations, particularly when uh, Mohammed bin Zayed uh, just visited London and Paris and was fed by Boris Johnson and Emmanuel Macron for that role and has also aided U.S. policy by, for example, allowing Afghan pilots from Uzbekistan not to return to the Taliban-controlled regime with their equipment, but instead re return to UAE as a safe place. So I think that they'll be competing in terms of soft power and for recognition and for acceptance by the West as assistants and supporters of their policies. Beyond this status and this uh, recognition competition, I also think that there will be a competition amongst uh, the Gulf countries for relationships with non-Western powers. So we've already seen, for example, Faisal bin Farhan just take a trip, Saudi foreign minister just take a trip to India to discuss the Afghan situation. We've seen uh, Iran try to reach out to the Indians about trying to, uh, to, to, to rescue the Chabar Port project. And as confidence in American leadership falls, 
there's going to be more and more of a competition for using their positions in Afghanistan or any leverage they might have there to strengthen their relationships with Russia, with India, with China. So that's where I see another vector of competition forming. And then beyond the status in this competition for recognition by non-Western powers, I see an over-the-horizon rivalry happening inside Central Asia, where the Gulf countries have been competing quite assertively for influence. So of the GCC countries, the UAE seems to be the front runner with regards to influence in Central Asia. If you're looking at uh, DP World, for example, participating in a 49% stake in the Special Economic Zone in the Caspian port of Aktau, and they're also involved in Korgos and the Chinese-Kazakhstan border. We're seeing Mubadala opening a coal operation in Kazakhstan, Emirati investment in the Turkmen energy sector, uh, Mubadala also entering Uzbekistan. So the UAE has got a strong advantage there. Iran has been assiduously strengthening its relationships with uh, Central Asian countries. Those relationships with Tajikistan in particular, and to a lesser extent, Uzbekistan, can blow hot and cold. We will see as they try to engage in Afghanistan, the Gulf countries, them competing for contracts and competing for maybe even uh, security training uh, and tra training of the soldiers in their academies, that kind of thing, in, uh, in Central Asia. So we'll see a remote over the horizon rivalry. So not a proxy war in the conventional sense or proxy rivalry uh, like we've seen in Libya and the Horn of Africa and the Sahel, more these areas of competition. So that addresses the first uh, by overarching points on how the Gulf states are going to respond. And now I just wanted to provide a brief run through of how I see each Gulf state approaching the uh, situation in Afghanistan. So uh, with respect to uh, Iran, I would say that their position in Afghanistan has really got three different views within the foreign policy establishment over there. The general view amongst the hardliners, and was also shared by Iranian proxy groups like the Houthis and Hezbollah, is that this is a major defeat for American leadership, and uh, this is largely a success. There's a minority view amongst the hardliners that this Taliban withdrawal was some kind of an American conspiracy to uh, create instability in Central Asia and in their regional neighborhood. But for the most part, the hardliners are generally happier with this than the more moderate and reformist voices. Uh, we've even seen veiled criticisms of the inclusivity of the Taliban's uh, cabinet from the uh, voices like former Foreign Minister Jawad Zarif, the Iranians questioning Pakistan's involvement in the offensive on Panjir Valley. So that's what I'm saying. So I think that Iran, the issue of the Taliban is a very polarizing issue within Iran. There's multiple reactions to it rather than a single one. And uh, that's uh, just generally how I see the situation unfolding over there. Obviously, the, this is a benefit for Iran in some ways in terms of their engagement with non-Western powers. Iran is going to be joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Russia has called for Iran to play a more assertive role in the extended troika. So the extended troika four members plus two would be Iran and India. So that would be something that they could give them some status. But on the flip side, India's $3 billion in aid and investment in Afghanistan has gone astray now with the Taliban takeover and the future of Chabahar is very questionable, particularly with China building in Gwadar, the North-South Corridor developing, and the Taliban taking a lot more interest out naturally in Chinese-led infrastructure projects than anything involving India. So it's a mixture of strategic wins and losses for Iran, and they're viewing the situation apprehensively, and there's also not a single reaction internally, including within the hardliners around Raisi. So Iran will probably blow hot and cold with the Taliban, engage with it cautiously without recognizing it, and also that be cognizant of potential security risks and spillover while framing itself as a bulwark against ISIS-K. Now turning towards the uh, GCC countries. These are my initial impressions of, of their involvement. Looking at Qatar, I think that Qatar has arguably achieved a more substantial victory out of this uh, crisis in Afghanistan in terms of prestige, in terms of soft power, than any of the GCC countries. It's best equipped moving forward. So you've already seen the Aludade base uh, engage in uh, creating an emergency field hospital, handing out 50,000 meals a day to Afghan families, airlifting thousands of people, engaging uh, on the security of the Kabul airport, even as Turkey's been wavering on it, they've been taking the lead over there. This has been a major status boost for Qatar. We saw the Qatari foreign minister become the first GC international leader, actually, to visit Afghanistan and to engage with members of the Taliban, as well as uh, officials like Hamid Karzai and Abdullah Abdullah, and that set the tone for the Russians, Chinese, and Pakistanis to send lower level delegations this week to engage with the very same figures on similar issues. So Qatar has been taking the lead in terms of diplomatic engagement, 
and it has gained a lot in terms of prestige and status. And I think it comes out of this with a with lot of wind in its sails as a major winner in this regard. With regards to the UAE, the situation is a bit more complicated. So uh, the general consensus inside the UAE is one of grave disappointment with the American withdrawal. So I spoke to Abdul Halek Abdullah, who's one of the leading political scientists over there, and he was basically saying there's never been a situation in his memory where trust in America has been so low. So that is uh, that includes incidents like Abkaik, where the uh, Saudi Aramco facility was attacked and American leadership was shaken under Trump, or uh, Operation Peace Spring with the Kurds when Turkey made that offensive. So the gravity of this U.S. withdrawal is really sinking in. And as the UAE is the GCC country that has perhaps the most developed set of relationships with non-Western powers, in particular Russia, as well as to some degree China and India, the UAE is going to be using this as a way to further expedite their pivot towards the collective non-West. Also, it's important to keep in mind that the Taliban regime is not a natural partner for the UAE, even though the Emirates were one of the only three countries in the world to recognize it from 96 to 2001. And it's obviously because of their views on political Islam. This is the quote from Mohammed bin Zayed talking to Mike Pompeo, basically calling the Taliban to be bearded and backward and bad. That was kind of what he described them as. So the memory of that hangs over. And it's a long way away from the days in which the UAE was actually competing with Qatar for a diplomatic office. So those days are, 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 are long behind. So the UAE will probably try to help American policy, as I said earlier, and provide humanitarian assistance. That will be its short-term gateway. And then it'll wait and see and try to carve out a position of its own. Its policies are flexible, as we've seen in so many other regions of the world. They might also use Afghanistan as a stepping stone to expand its influence in South Asia. Pakistan is questionable about them because they think that, you know, Emirati policy is really a function of Saudi and U.S. policy in Afghanistan. But the Emiratis did try to broker a, a truce or at least a de-escalation between India and Pakistan over Kashmir in April. So maybe they might use a presence in Afghanistan to strengthen their relationships with South Asian countries. And they could find some bonding with India on the political Islam issue. With respect to Saudi Arabia, they're uh, obviously even more spectators, I think, in this regard than the UAE have been. And uh, there's no return to the 1996-2001 relationship of recognition under Mohammed bin Salman, because that would be able to energize uh, clerics and Islamist elements at home that would question his authority and would uh, undermine MBS's vision of creating a new Saudi Arabia. So I don't see much engagement from the Saudis just yet. The Saudis have been strengthening some of their relationships with countries in the, uh, in the surrounding region, including Tajikistan. And of course, the Saudis have an exceptional amount of financial influence and leverage over Pakistan. So will that hold and become something? Right now, the Saudis seem to be engaging more with the Indians on the Afghan issue, actually, than the Pakistanis. And uh, Faisal bin Farhan's comments about the Taliban and transnational terrorism and concerns about Al-Qaeda and ISIS are playing as music to the Indians' ears. So Saudi Arabia is still trying to sort out its policy. And surprisingly, it's been edging closer to India rather than using its leverage over Pakistan in this early stage. With respect to the smaller Gulf countries, I'm coming to an end now, just for a few very brief remarks. Bahrain, much like the UAE and Qatar, used uh, the Fifth Fleet and its transit facilities for good use for you in terms of uh, helping in the evacuations. So that was a positive thing. Obviously, they'll be maybe cognizant of the issue of the Hazaras to some degree because they're a majority shared country. Same thing goes with Kuwait and their minority Shia community. Will that play a role? But Kuwait has also been involved in evacuations and in uh, the, the, the movement of 5,000 evacuees, for example, right before the Kabul airport attack being one example. Oman has been basically just saying this is in, in, in classic form, non-interference. This is an issue for the Afghans to sort out. And, the, uh, and they haven't really formulated a policy yet that's been that defined or distinct. So that's, that's where things stand with Oman. So I've just given a brief overview in terms of just these uh, comments. I think that there's going to be disparate reactions, but no movement towards recognition within the Gulf. And the competition is likely to occur further afield in terms of prestige, reputation, and soft power, rather than for resources and for a geopolitical foothold inside Afghanistan itself. So those are my overarching remarks at this point. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, now we are, need to move a little bit for, to the west and north to Europe. Uh, Dr. Yulia Sabina Joja is uh, a senior fellow at uh, in the Afghanistan Watch Project at the Middle East Institute and the Frontier Europe Initiative. She is a uh, 
senior fellow as well, adjunct professor, excuse me, at Georgetown University, my alma mater, and has uh, a great deal of uh, research and teaching on European and Black Sea history. Uh, she served as an advisor to the Romanian president and is a uh, deputy project manager at the NATO Allied Command Transportation Transformation in, uh, in, in the United States. Uh, she will tell us, uh, hopefully, how Europe views uh, what has happened in Afghanistan, how Europe uh, sees particularly uh, the role of the Gulf states and what does Europe expect from them. And does Europe see any role for itself in the future in Afghanistan? Uh, 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 Yulia, please. Thank you, Ambassador. And um, it's it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so what I want to talk, um, talk to all of you about um, a little bit is um, the background to the current policy that European powers are adopting or are about to adopt vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. To your last question, Ambassador, I would say, um, and, and this is maybe the theme of it, um, that Europeans do not um, see um, themselves as having neither the means nor the political will to play an active role in Afghanistan. Um, but they have to find solutions to their own problems um, and, and Afghanistan being one that is affecting and polarizing um, European powers to a great extent. So really there are um, three main dimension of, of uh, Europe's policy vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan, and some of them um, have a direct impact on relations um, between EU member states and, and Gulf states. Um, so there's first the strategic um, element, how Europe is, is placing itself um, between all these powers in the context of um, the Taliban return to power in Afghanistan. Then there's the political, um, the political issues around Afghanistan and how Europeans perceive um, their role there. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, is the refugee policy of Europe. And that entails really two dimensions. Um, domestically, um, what Europeans want to do about um, Af Afghan asylum seekers and externally in their relations with um, Gulf states and other, um, other uh, actors um, uh, relevant to Afghanistan. So first, strategically, for Europe, um, the withdrawal from Afghanistan is perceived, and this is very important, as another failure of common European security and defense. Uh, Europeans have been trying for decades now to build a more robust military that can act independently of the United States, um, but um, they have not been able to do that so far. Specifically, um, the inability of Europeans to maintain airport security and organize evacuations of their own citizens um, without American support in Afghanistan has triggered new discussions at EU level, both politically and operationally operationally as well. And then politically, the, the second element, um, the withdrawal from Afghanistan has currently rippling effects um, in European member states policy. Uh, the Dutch foreign and defense ministers are maybe the most striking example. Um, both have resigned last week due to pressure, political pressure in their own country, and uh, failure to communicate and manage the withdrawal from the perspective of the Dutch. Um, in the UK, we've seen um, the foreign secretary being reshuffled. In Germany, there have been serious calls for the foreign minister to resign as well following Afghanistan withdrawal. Um, and then the EU Council President Charles Michel um, issued a letter with very harsh um, self-critique um, and, and language for the failure of the EU overall and of its member states to ensure unassisted evacuations of both EU citizens and their Afghan colleagues on the ground. Furthermore, across European um, member states, there is now a lot of thinking going on in terms of the future of transatlantic relations, and this is important for Afghanistan too. Um, the Biden administration has shown um, Europe over the last few weeks um, that it is pivoting towards the Indo-Pacific. Um, I think someone mentioned that a bit earlier too. And Europeans are looking at the next um, security challenges that include beyond the withdrawal possible new migration waves from Afghanistan and other regional, uh, regional challenges, such as um, north-south migration, 
uh, or south north rather rather um, in in Russia on um, on their own continent. And then finally, the third element is refugee policy with the two dimensions of um, domestic asylum policy for Europeans um, and uh, the engagement of EU um, powers with partners to build what um, is known as kind of the concept of fortress Europe. Uh, Afghanistan more uh, imminently is uh, a reminder for um, a very flawed EU asylum policy for Europeans that has created so many political problems um, within Europe uh, since 2015 and the major migration wave back then. Um, and we are seeing this in several European offers of financial incentives to countries, including Pakistan, to manage possible migration flaws on a bilateral level, first of all. Um, and a few weeks ago, the EU agreed on a common approach to working with the Taliban, consisting of um, putting human rights and security conditions um, uh, as conditions for engaging with the Taliban. Basically, European leaders decided that the EU has no choice but to engage with the Taliban, though this will not mean, they say, uh, uh, recognition though for the um, Taliban, this can mean increased legitimacy as well. Uh, EU foreign policy leader um, Borrell said um, five very high benchmarks for the new government in Afghanistan um, and with very um, small chances of, of the Taliban respecting that to be able to um, start um, some kind of a financial engagement. The EU is setting up also, very importantly, a platform for cooperation with Afghanistan's neighbors. That includes Pakistan and Iran, as well as um, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and India. And the EU is um, uh, still trying to coordinate as we speak further evacuations through, through European countries' individual volunteer contributions, um, basically through an informal understanding with the Taliban. Um, and the EU is also putting up a fund for neighbors um, of up to 1 billion euros. Um, and finally, additionally um, to that, um, uh, in terms of the humanitarian uh, aid, um, the EU is, um, uh, the European Union is building up a fund or an aid package um, for Afghanistan that looks like it's going to be um, worth about $350 million. Um, and then um, there's the issue in terms of refugees of um, uh, domestic or resettlement clashes within Europe, with several member states of the European, uh, the European Union arguing um, that uh, the EU should make concrete pledges on resettlement that would allow Afghans in need to legally migrate to the bloc. Um, but basically, this discussion is around whether paying for securing borders in fortress Europe or whether the EU instead uh, should take on the responsibility of developing a program for Afghan refugees. Um, what has been established and, and will take place in, in a couple of days in October is an EU high level um, resettlement forum. Um, and um, beyond that, um, uh, and what that means for asylum seekers, um, EU is discussing 30,000 um, at the EU level, though Germany is discussing 40,000 at the national level. But when it comes to, and, and with, this, with this I'll wrap up, um, when it comes to European expectations vis-a-vis -vis the Gulf, um, on the Afghanistan issue, um, I think um, the most important thing that has uh, been visible is um, some Gulf um, uh, member states uh, or state support to European countries in organizing and supporting evacuation efforts that have been more than welcomed by European powers and, uh, uh, and also welcomed as being seen as assuming a greater responsibility and an important role vis-a-vis -vis migration and refugee policies overall. Overall. Um, but then finally, the most um, significant burden for Europe um, in terms of Afghanistan and, and the refugee policy that Europe um, is adopting will be via um, Iran and Turkey. Um, as Afghan migration numbers increase at the Turkish border, and we've seen statements from the Turkish president um, as well, there's a lot of concern um, in the relationship that Europeans um, will have to adopt um, in regulating these migration flows particularly through Iran. Thank you. Finally, uh, we have uh, Ambassador Javid Ahmed, uh, currently at the Atlantic Council South Asia Center, as well as 
Afghanistan's ambassador to the United Arab Emirates. Uh, he is a non-resident fellow at the uh, West Point Modern War Institute, where he's focused on uh, security, violent extremist extremism, and uh, other issues of, of uh, in South Asia, primarily in Afghanistan and Pakistan. He is uh, Ambassador uh, Ahmed has worked with U.S. defense uh, contractors, providing analysis and assessments to U.S. government clients and to the U.S. government on Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the region in general. In particular, we are I'd like to ask Ambassador uh, Ahmed how uh, he expects the, uh, the Taliban government in uh, Kabul to reach out to the Gulf states. I think it is much to our surprise that the Taliban arrived uh, ready and, uh, and able to make a presentation uh, at the UNGA. Uh, they clearly had their act together much more than they had it uh, the last unfortunate time that they ruled in Afghanistan. So uh, without more ado, what uh, will the Afghan, what will the new Afghan Taliban government do reaching out to uh, Gulf states and perhaps beyond them? Dr. Ahmed, Ambassador Ahmed, excuse me. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador, for putting this together. Uh, and thank you for having me. It's great to be here with all of you. Uh, just one quick correction. I'm no longer the Afghan ambassador as of uh, 10 days or two weeks ago. I'm, I'm, I'm now back at the Atlantic Council in Washington. Um, but thank you for those questions. Um, it's it's never a, a, a dull time in and around Afghanistan, but uh, you know we, we saw that last month, unfortunately, uh, was particularly harrowing for many Afghans and our partners. Um, we saw uh, the Afghan government, the Afghan Republic gone, uh, neither exist. But what happened in Afghanistan, I think, um, it, it wasn't all by accident, you know, much of it was uh, our own making and perhaps this is, you know, some kind of a, uh, a disgust of self-recognition on our part, uh, which we need to recognize and acknowledge. Now, um, while the Republic was not a perfect or a functioning umbrella, you know, it, it, was, it was far from it, uh, in fact, but it was also one that, you know, we thought that, lived, uh, that you know, the, the world and our neighbors and um, our international partners can live with and work with. Um, right now, it is, um, it is the Taliban's government. They own it. Uh, whatever happens after this, um, you know, they, they, they are responsible for it. The Taliban have a cabinet now. It's an ex a, 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 you know, a broadly exclusive cabinet, not inclusive. Uh, it's definitely not uh, inclusive um, at the substantive level. Uh, it's definitely not politically inclusive, nor inclusive from an ideological perspective or uh, ethnic perspective or even gender perspective. But had it been somewhat inclusive, at least at the you know symbolic level, you know, minus the fact that they have very uh, unsavory uh, cast of characters in their cabinet, um, I think it would have created you know a sliver of hope um, for an inclusive government. However, radical you know the, the general broader views and practices of that inclusive government uh, may have been. But um, the Taliban have said that, uh, that, that their new government is temporary until the dust settles. But I think it's my understanding that there is a growing temptation um, on the part of the Taliban leadership right now, however you know, fragmented that leadership may, may be, to make this temporary permanent um, as they settle in uh, in their seats in those institutions and as they enjoy you know, the resources that come with those institutions, uh, which they have and they continue to claim with vengeance. Now, the Taliban will continue to consolidate their presence across the country. They will increasingly become more and more uh, internally repressive, as we have seen in the past couple of weeks. Uh, but they will also, you know, increasingly become externally aggressive, uh, mainly towards uh, the southern countries, particularly uh, Pakistan. So for now, it, what is more important is that uh, the Taliban struggle uh, 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 internal struggle is uh, about managing the power, uh, managing the power and managing it among themselves in their uh, like wearing factions rather than managing and uh, governing the country. Uh, and this tension between, you know, managing power and governing is, is not really a new phenomena uh, among them. Um, the last, uh, but also uh, among uh, ourselves, we, we saw it in our government and the last government and the one even before uh, us. 
the same thing happened. But what is very important right now is that within the Taliban, however, this power struggle among the different Taliban factions have already become quite lethal, as we have seen, you know, uh, deadly tensions between the different Taliban camps, including um, and particularly the southern Taliban leaders, the Kandaris and the Helmandis, but also the Pakistan-based Haqqani network, which is essentially uh, the main uh, folks who are calling the shots in Kabul now. So the immediate challenge um, uh, in priority for the Taliban right now is to convince in essentially coax their own ranks uh, uh, and reach some sort of a intra-Taliban settlement among themselves before they can convince the world, you know, including the Gulf states and the uh, US and our European partners for support and legitimacy. But let's say, um, you know, when the Taliban does get to governing and, you know, engaging with foreign countries as a government, you know, how might they do it? Uh, you know, how might the new government uh, in Afghanistan approach the country's neighbors, uh, particularly uh, the Gulf states? Uh, and how would the Taliban uh, basically form that country's foreign policy. Now, uh, first on, on foreign policy, um, uh, foreign in, you know, security policy, I think the Taliban's approach to conducting foreign and security policy is quite simple, uh, yet it's also quite unique and sophisticated. Uh, they have now integrated mullahs and religious scholars into their you know, broad ca uh, cast of characters in their new foreign and security institutions, from foreign ministry to Ministry of Defense to Ministry of Interior, um, but also to the intelligence uh, services. Now, considering how the Taliban ran the, their very issues-driven, you know, issue-specific commissions uh, before they were a government, and the way their internal uh, apparatus uh, and consultations uh, mechanism function um, as, a, as a small group rather than as a discipline interagency process or in an inter uh, uh, ministerial process i think the new government is would take that into account and they would likely pursue uh, a, a dual track foreign policy uh, you know the first track will will will, will likely be uh, openly conducted in the public sphere where we will see more uh, message discipline and purposefulness in the Taliban's public commentary, uh, and this would be not just promote their foreign policy objectives, uh, but also to use that, you know, uh, very sort of methodical public messaging, uh, not just to test the public temperature about those issues, but also um, seek um, uh, and obtain international responsiveness and receptiveness to them. So, but the Taliban right now, uh, in order to do so, they, they are missing a winning uh, or a, a populist message where they could convene around. I think the second track uh, will be conducted, uh, the second track in their foreign and security policy uh, will be conducted more discreetly, you know, where uh, I think the Taliban would engage in backdoor deals, in backdoor arrangements with countries. Uh, also, you know, some uh, outfits, uh, something I think they have uh, learned uh, quite well from countries they have uh, uh, close experience with, like the Pakistanis and the Qataris. So uh, this this dual track approach is likely to determine how the Taliban would also approach its relationship with foreign countries, but also with foreign fighters. So um, as it stands right now, the Taliban um, uh, stand at a juncture where they would welcome any partnership with countries of the world, with any country. You know, they will, in fact, speak to and talk to anyone who will listen, um, because for them, it's a matter of maintaining and solidifying uh, not just their legitimacy, but also um, seeking uh, the support that they desperately need. So um, for the Taliban's, um, uh, for, 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 uh, as a group, uh, the immediate challenge right now is to find uh, some kind of a, a common language, not just with the region, but also with the Gulf states. Um, a few very specific points about, you know, how um, the Taliban might approach uh, uh, the Gulf states or how the Gulf, uh, some of the Gulf states might approach uh, uh, the new government uh, in Kabul. Now, first uh, is the, um, on just a bit on uh, Qatar. Uh, Qatar, you know, as Dr. Ramani said, they didn't recognize the Taliban in the 1990s, and at the time their argument was that it's a it's a neutral country and they don't have to recognize them. But you know, this time around, uh, we saw that the Qataris are very likely to recognize um, uh, the uh, the Taliban, you know, given their very cozy relationship with the group. Uh, 
you know, over the years, the Qataris managed to cultivate a very strong, a very reliable partner in the Taliban. Um, and they have it now in the Taliban's Afghanistan. Uh, you know, Dr. Mani mentioned this, not only did they host the Taliban's political office all these years, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the Qataris flew Mullah Baradar in a Qatari Air Force plane to Afghanistan after the Taliban's takeover. So that relationship is that strongly codependent. So on its part, I think, and this is important, that Doha now has a very strong and reliable, you know, new Muslim Brotherhood type of a, a partner, uh, possibly one that's more ideologically attuned to the Qatari's ideology. Um, and, and, and maybe unlike the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, uh, this time around, this is also more powerful group and, and less vulnerable to any ex external aggressions or external machinations. So Qatar, I think in this case, uh, will play the big brother role um, in Afghanistan to the new Taliban uh, uh, government, in which I think they will play a very significant part in instilling the the the, the, the Qatari version of that political Islam into the Taliban's Afghanistan, um, and and this would also determine how the Taliban would conduct uh, our business. Uh, uh, the on on the Emiratis. Um, the, the UAE has changed, uh, you know, as mentioned, since 1990s, which was, you know, one of the countries that recognized the Taliban regime. But they have, you know, um, taken a very sharp ideological turn against all forms of extremism. You know, the good thing is that um, uh, the Emiratis have uh, long had a very diversified approach to conducting not only foreign and security policy, but also economic policy. And this doesn't apply only to South Asian states, but also, you know, the UAE's relationship with any countries, you know, in, in the Persian Gulf, but also beyond. And that's you know, a very key and competitive advantage um, the UAE has in the region. Now, the Afghan portfolio in the UAE is, is grouped in the national security category, and it falls under uh, the direct supervision of their national security advisor. So at the moment, um, uh, as it was mentioned, it's a, it's a wait and see policy on the Emirati's part uh, with respect to Afghanistan, but they're also establishing a back channel of communication and a, a kind of a more discreet cooperation mechanism with the Taliban without formally recognizing them, um, or at least for now. So the UAE has a, a, a very legitimate security concerns. Um, uh, they have, they're home to remnants of the Taliban regime from the 90s, uh, including the Haqqanis. In fact, one of the Haqqanis' wives, the senior Haqqani, Jalaluddin Haqqani's wife, currently lives in, in the UAE. Um, the, um, so this new UAE, UAE or new emirate, uh, uh, is also particularly against the Qatari and the Egyptian uh, version of political Islam. Which I mentioned, so which the Taliban are likely to adopt in their own governance approach. So, um, Taliban leader, for example, Mullah Brother, they used to have very long session with the with the Doha-based uh, Muslim Brotherhood leader Qaradavi. Uh, the UAE didn't like it. Um, so, um, and that's why you know I I feel um, it's my understanding that the UAE is uh, very unlikely to recognize the new Taliban government until after you know the United States does at least or at least um, until after there is some kind of a prior understanding with Washington, because the Emiratis care very deeply uh, about their relationship with Washington. So for now, um, it's my understanding that the UAE will buy their security uh, from the Taliban. Um, they've already made a very earlier outreach to the Taliban. Um, and that outreach was made, I think, as early as August 17. That was practically two days after the collapse of the, uh, the previous government. And they've already sent about um, you know, seven or eight uh, humanitarian flights um, to Afghanistan. Very quickly on the, um, like on the Saudis, um, I think the Saudis don't want to have anything to do with Afghanistan. They, they're very concerned about terrorism, of course, mainly uh, Al-Qaeda reconstituting, um, but there are also elements of um, Afghan diaspora community who uh, in, inside uh, Saudi Arabia that hold some of those very sympathetic views towards the Taliban. But otherwise, I think the Saudis have taken a, a back seat. Uh, for now, they're likely to uh, instrumentalize their partnership with Pakistan um, and maybe deputize them to ensure um, uh, their security on the ground. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, you uh, you all have given a really comprehensive uh, picture across the board of what uh, 
the current state of the relationship is between the Taliban, between Afghanistan and the Gulf states and other interested parties. Uh, before we turn to questions from the audience, I would like to, uh, an issue that has uh, actually a bit of great interest to me. Uh, the Taliban took over completely uh, the entire country. There was a functioning government with all its flaws across Afghanistan. Uh, have the Taliban tried to co-opt that government, to co-opt at least the pieces of the government, the various individual officers, or did they have a, uh, uh, a plan of their own of how they would govern, of the structure of the government, more decentralized, less decentralized uh, local authorities, what role they play? And I ask this question because uh, clearly the first question that has arisen in the West and in the Gulf is, as uh, Professor Bahir said at the beginning, Afghanistan faces a humanitarian disaster uh, that may rival humanitarian disaster in Yemen if aid does not come in in many ways. How do you actually, how do the aid donors actually believe that they can get aid into the country because just giving money is not a very good idea. Uh, you're going to have to move supplies. Will the, uh, the Taliban government or uh, have a structure in place where it can actually provide and distribute the aid properly? Uh, uh, do the donors depend more on uh, uh, civil society to do so? Uh, can civil society do it? So what is the structure of government in uh, Afghanistan that would help the donors operate? I'll take anybody on that one. I think Professor Bahir dropped off. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, that, I should take that. Um, the, you know, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the cast of characters that we, we see right now in, uh, in, in the Taliban's new uh, cabinet and their new government is quite exclusive to the Taliban. You know, there are at least 17 members of the Taliban uh, in the cabinet that are on some kind of a uh, blacklist or, you know, foreign sanction list, including the United States and the United Nations. So the cabinet they have right now, it's not quite inclusive. They have Siraj Akhani, who is the head of the Afghanistan Ministry of Interior, responsible for the police system. And he is basically uh, the head of the Haqqani network. Uh, they have uh, the, the Taliban spiritual leader's son, Malaya Koop, uh, who is the Minister of Defense. Uh, in, uh, you know, one of those Taliban fives who were uh, uh, released from Guantanamo um, uh, in 2014 or 2015 uh, is now the head of the Afghanistan intelligence services. Uh, one of their deputies is the one who was uh, uh, on, on the uh, U.S.'s uh, long time, basically, target list. Uh, uh, his name is Jawad. Um, so, you know, as we look at, uh, you know, the Taliban's cabinet right now, it's definitely not, you know, inclusive, you know, as I mentioned, definitely not a substantive level. It's not gender inclusive or ideologically inclusive uh, to ensure that, you know, that they could accommodate uh, some opposing views, including from, you know, technocrats or people who serve in the previous governments uh, or even gender inclusive, you know, to include people uh, from, you know, another gender. So. Um, so had it been somewhat inclusive, at least, at least you know, symbolically, uh, despite all these people that are in the cabinet, I think it, it, there would have been a bit of a hope um, for, um, for, for, like for governance and for engagements, like with that recognition, as it was mentioned by Dr. Romani. Um, so for now, uh, unfortunately, uh, they are busy with you know, managing the power. Because the, the friction fight, the, the 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 friction and the infighting within the within the group has you know really increased. It's it's also quite real, but it's also lethal and it kind of carries. It doesn't bode well for for the Taliban or for their new government. I'm not sure. Um, they, they have kept the, the the larger edifice of the previous government as a structure. Uh, it's also quite uh, centralized, highly centralized, as it was in, in the previous government. So none of those things have changed. Um, I believe uh, they will, um, you know, since they used to rule through commissions, specific commission, commission for financial 
uh, services for intelligence, for security, for military, for culture. They will now basically um, transition all of those to certain ministries, but they, they, they've taken certain actions to uh, merge some of those entities that were um, created uh, as duplicate entities, um, which I think is good, but uh, it all depends on how uh, they're going to uh, govern and whether or not they will be able to convene a team, a proper team, uh, an economic team, for example, um, to see if they could uh, render those uh, very basic services. Um, I'm not sure civil society is the um, at this point a solution because civil society isn't a government. Um, it's also uh, civil society in Afghanistan also not quite vibrant. A lot of those NGOs and organizations have since left. Uh, they've evacuated. Those operations are even suspended temporarily or, or they're put on hold. So uh, in many cases in the past uh, government, and maybe this is a you know, that sort of uh, uh, disgust of uh, self-recognition, that civil society was not quite civil uh, in many respects as well. So uh, until that, uh, you know, uh, the civil society reinvents itself and the Taliban allows them to operate, um, uh, it, it is the Taliban and their government's responsibility to uh, provide services. And, and having said that, uh, that's a rather bleak picture. Uh, Afghanistan does face within a few weeks or a few months a major humanitarian problem. I uh, was listening to the BBC this morning about a hospital that has about a month left of medicines and other medical supplies at best in, uh, in Kabul. Uh, if uh, the situation deteriorates, do, uh, I mean, clearly, no one, no one either in the Gulf or in Europe or any place else is going to give money. I think in the United States, there is no appetite at all uh, for any official support uh, to the Taliban. Uh, is there any appetite either in the Gulf or in uh, Europe to try and push the Taliban into uh, organizing themselves, into allowing uh, international aid organizations to come in? Or would, do you think the preference, particularly in in the Gulf, but even in Europe, would be to let the Taliban stew in their own mess first uh, before they try to push anything. Julia, so if I may, on the on the European and overall Western side, I briefly mentioned um, at the beginning um, that um, the EU is trying to create a fund um, for um, Afghanistan in terms of humanitarian aid in parallel with a, a fund and a political platform um, for um, aid to um, possible refugees in all neighboring countries. So we already see kind of a, a two-track um, approach to that um, with, um, with probably the thinking, um, the, the background in mind that um, this humanitarian crisis that is uh, that is on hold or, or emerging as we as we look to Afghanistan will lead to uh, migration waves into um, into the or at least pressure into the neighboring countries, all of them um, surrounding Af uh, Afghanistan. At the same time, if we're looking right now at the United Nations General Assembly, there's a lot of um, uh, of uh, movement from the whole international community um, to establish some kind of a of an aid um, of an aid uh, package uh, for Afghanistan in terms of humanitarian aid, and we've seen um, Western countries already stepping up, as well as some some Gulf countries in um, in providing or or pledging some of the aid. The question, indeed, um, Ambassador, is how. Um, will this be um, be transferred, um, or how how are Western countries and other international players um, thinking of transferring this aid so that it gets to the Afghan people and uh, not does not end up in in the hands of the government of the Taliban government? And I think um, if we are to look um, just at the EU and EU member states, they have a strong preference um, to uh, uh, for international uh, aid uh, NGOs. Um, so. I think um, they are going to exert as much pressure, pressure as they can, that pressure being limited within the United uh, Nations and the General Assembly and the Security Council uh, and in other international fora to be able um, to pressure the Taliban into um, uh, accepting a more international aid presence on the ground. And then as a second option, 
um, they are considering, as we've already seen through bilateral deals um, and possibly even e an EU deal with um, with uh, other international players, where, whether we're looking at um, Afghanistan's neighbors or particularly at Gulf um, states such as Qatar as um, as being the the mediator um, for for a solution that um, can ensure uh, international humanitarian assistance directly to the Afghan people. Samuel, could I ask you the same question uh, for the Gulf states? Is there an appetite on the part of the Gulf states to uh, put their own mechanisms in place? The Qataris have taken over the operation, uh, already done it by taking over the operation of Kabul airport. That is certainly substituting in a way for the Afghan state apparatus at the moment. Is our uh, I'm not sure how much further uh, any Gulf state would like uh, would be prepared to go. Do you think there is an appetite there for doing that? Well, I think that there definitely is an appetite to some degree for the Gulf states to provide uh, humanitarian assistance towards Afghanistan, and the Taliban regime has certainly not been averse to those ideas. So Qatar, I think as of the 14th of September, when they last made a public statement about the extent of humanitarian aid, they said it had already crossed the $50 million mark. And that included mainly urgent food aid as well as medical assistance. The UAE has made four shipments as of last week of humanitarian aid. And the UAE has also tried to uh, ease flight passages too, acting as an air bridge towards Kabul. So there, there are ways already in which the Gulf states have tried to allow aid to enter Afghanistan and the Taliban regime has been on board with them. Now, when you actually look at Taliban aligned social media accounts, uh, which I've been following quite closely, and I've been doing some interviews with figures on all sides of the spectrum within Afghanistan, you get a feeling that the Taliban is willing to pretty much uh, take money from wherever they can get it. Even when Britain came through with a 286 million pounds in terms of aid, when Boris Johnson reversed the aid cuts, there were uh, people on those Taliban social media accounts who were saying we shouldn't be accepting uh, aid from uh, Western countries, but others were saying this is a positive step. So I think that there will be a great deal of pragmatism with regards to that urgent food and humanitarian aid coming in from the Taliban side, and the Gulf countries will probably try to prop it up in the short term. Another thing to watch with regards to the Gulf involvement in humanitarian aid is that Saudi Arabia has been relatively uh, detached here. It just seems to be more of a Qatar UAE effort. And a second more important point is actually in relation to Iran and the Afghanistan border. So for three weeks after the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, from August 15th until like the end of the first week of September, there really was a suspension of Iranian-Afghan border trade. And that's always been an important lifeline for both sides, right? Because for the Iranians, the Afghan side gave them U.S. dollars. And also there's a lot of towns and cities and merchants who kind of straddle those two boundaries historically, which is why Afghanistan got sanctions waivers from, from the United States on Iran, or at least try to get them repeatedly in the, in, in the past. So the question is, how much will, will, will that happen? Uh, will Iran, for example, invest in transit routes like the Kafirat Railway Link or the uh, transit route from the Sea of Oman towards Afghanistan? The, some Iranian media and academics are talking about that idea. Or will Iran try to piggyback off of uh, existing connectivity projects in the region? It's not part of TAPI, it's not really, but it is part of the North South Corridor. Could that play a role in, uh, in facilitating aid and development in Afghanistan? So I think that the Gulf uh, countries already have very. Uh, baseline strategies and very un unformed strategies to deal with it. And the Taliban, I think, are going to be more pragmatic than one might expect, at least when it comes to aid from the Gulf. Ambassador, uh, may I? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, th there is no consistency among the Gulf states as to, you know, how to approach Afghanistan. And, you know, because of their own tensions, you know, the, the Emiratis and the Qataris or the Emiratis with, uh, uh, like, with the Turks uh, uh, or, or, or so any of these groupings, there, there is, a, there is a, a varying degree of consensus on how to move forward, but they would not deputize as to, uh, you know, who should do what uh, and on whose behalf. Uh, you know, some of those countries are doing some stuff. You know, the Emiratis have provided some of those humanitarian assistance through, you know, various flights. The Qataris are trying to do uh, those things, as you mentioned, through the, the Kabul airport. Uh, now, the, the humanitarian assistance so far that's been provided by some of those countries in the Gulf. Uh, it's only pledged. It's it's uh, some 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 are you know provided. That's fine. It's helpful, but it's also insignificant because, 
you cannot run a government, you cannot run a country, you know, by humanitarian assistance. You know, much of the humanitarian assistance that's been provided or pledged at least uh, is also political. Uh, so in the medium to longer term, humanitarian assistance is not the solution because, you know, think about it. The, the, the uh, uh, Afghanistan's uh, uh, U.S. and European partners uh, spent some eight or nine billion dollars in Afghanistan's last year, you know, in different sectors. So if you translate that into humanitarian assistance, that would mean, you know, the world, uh, you know, spent some, uh, you know, uh, over 300 million dollars in humanitarian assistance in Afghanistan every day. So. Uh, and still, there was drought, there was unemployment, there was famine, uh, there was starvation. So, um, uh, so that's why you know it's it's my understanding that some of the countries that have provided or you know or have pledged humanitarian assistance, including the UAE, which I think have pledged about fifty million dollars. Uh, the same with the Chinese, you know, uh, thirty-one million dollars in emergency assistance. It's just a speck of what the United States and our European partners used to spend in Afghanistan in just a day, uh, because that aid would then only benefit uh, right now uh, about maybe a million or two million people, and it won't get to the ordinary and the most effective of the population. Now, having said all of that, uh, it, it does not mean that there shouldn't be any engagement with the new government. In fact, you know, the opposite. So. It's my, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, understanding that the, we, we need to have, we need to engage in some kind of an economic creativity uh, uh, and come up with some kind of a special economic focus engagement mechanism in country, in, inside Afghanistan, um, to be in place perhaps under the UN's umbrella. Because if we do it through the region, you know, providing assistance to the Pakistanis and then the outsourcing that, or, you know, if, if it goes to, Second, a second or third layer of hands, uh, it's not going to get to uh, the ordinary Afghans that most uh, uh, need uh, it and are uh, uh, the most affected. Question from the audience that I find is uh, related to the same uh, to this uh, discussion. Uh, uh, specifically, if the UN starts talking with the Taliban, most of the Taliban membership in one way or another is on somebody's terrorism list, a B list. Uh, there are, these are people who, for whom international arrest warrants uh, might be produced, uh, people who would uh, certainly come to the attention of the International C uh, Criminal Court. Uh, what can the international, or has the international community, any stomach for overcoming this dilemma? I mean, uh, are we prepared to take the Haqqani network off a uh, list, uh, list of known terrorists? Uh, I think that's a very good question, and I think um, the West, um, especially if we look at the United States, both as well as European powers that um, uh, uh, acted in, in, in uh, Afghanistan um, as coalition partners to the United States, and um, oftentimes have overlapping lists, and of course there's the international UN list. I think um, if we're looking at, at these countries um, to the West, um, I think they haven't figured that out yet. Uh, I think it was a big surprise um, that, uh, and we've seen that in the media, that um, such a government, such a Taliban government uh, would be put in power with so many on, on UN or US um, terrorist uh, uh, lists. And, uh, and I think um, uh, the approach that we see from both the United States um, and uh, EU partners has been to wait and see, um, to uh, take uh, cues and hours for help uh, from countries such as the Gulf countries, Qatar, UAE, um, Saudi Arabia to a certain extent, um, to uh, find uh, find mediators and paths um, to a solution that, um, that would uh, enable, uh, again, providing aid and being able to somehow uh, engage with the government without, uh, without offering too much legitimacy and with the exclusion of, um, of recognition. So with that in mind, and with um, we've seen it described um, by, by um, the other panelists, the reluctance even of um, Gulf states to, uh, to engage or, or to provide recognition for this, um, for this Taliban government, um, I think, um, uh, and with the solution of, of wait and see, which is not really one, I think um, we'll have to um, to uh, uh, wait another few weeks to see, uh, unfortunately, how the crisis on the ground is um, 
is uh, is evolving um, so that uh, Western countries um, take a decision in that sense and whether they are willing to temporarily take off the list um, some of the government uh, members of the of the Taliban or um, they find ways around that to be able to engage with um, with those um, government officials um, now from from uh, the the Taliban government in Kabul um, that are not on the list and that um, are willing to engage with the West, as we've seen from the Taliban side as well, um, there's limited willingness um, and and a lot of wait and see on their side as well in terms of uh, wanting to accept aid um, and and cooperating or engaging in some kind of form with the West. Much that is uh, very enlightening. We're at the end of our time, so I would like to close with a question uh, from a former American diplomat. Clearly, the United States has not come off well in this entire story. But I'd like to ask each of you if you could uh, answer within a minute uh, each. Uh, what do the Gulf states, what do the Europeans, uh, what do the Afghans think the Americans might do in the future with regard to Afghanistan? Are we going to just fly the occasional drone over the place and try and bomb somebody? Are we going to engage? What do you? What do the people that you are uh, are experts on think the U.S. will do or should do? Let me begin with Samuel. So I think that there's not much confidence, at least in the Gulf, for example, that there will be any kind of expansive American military intervention after this, and they're pretty much looking at the over-the-horizon approach to counterterrorism, so the occasional drone, the occasional airstrike, like you said, because they don't really have any local partners now to work with. But within the U.S. government, there, be, there could become a question, obviously, about transnational terrorism. You have Mark Milley making the statement that, you know, the Taliban could fight ISIS. That seems to be an isolated point of view. But the over-the-horizon of the approach is getting some intense pushback from Republicans, including Mitch McConnell, as well as Democrats, saying that it just doesn't go far enough. So... The internal jockey in the U.S., I think, more than any kind of external pressure, will probably encourage the U.S. to do more militarily. I think that the Europeans were hoping, obviously, for a much more multilateral approach to the exit, like everybody leaving together. That's what Biden was saying on the April 14th speech. That didn't pan out. So there is talk, actually, amongst the, on the European side, including from Britain, with Ben Wallace saying that Britain might launch air, airstrikes or strikes on, on Taliban-backed uh, terrorist targets if, if they emerge. So what I think we'll see is like a over the horizon approach from the Americans and probably unilateral responses from the Europeans and the Gulf. The Gulf to advance their economic interests, the Europeans largely to combat immediate security threats and not really any kind of coordinated strategy. Uh, Yulia, uh, Samuel half answered the question for you, but if you could uh, sort of address it. Yes, um, uh, but I do think that uh, that uh, Sam um, is right in, in everything um, he's saying. And um, I think what I can add to that is, um, as I was trying to explain at the beginning, we see in Europe um, kind of um, uh, a process of acknowledging failure and trying to come up with solutions for Europeans as well as for Afghanistan, even that, even though that in Europe by default with the system or the decision making system is always very slow uh, and incremental. Um, but but there is, um, and we see that over the last few um, days, if not the last uh, week, we see a difference in approach between Europeans and Americans in that um, Europeans are resigning. There's a lot of political pressure, whether, um, whereas in the United States, we have not seen, we've seen in the early days, a lot of pressure from um, especially the, uh, the journalist side um, and from the opposition, but uh, from the Republicans, but um, it has sort of... Um, uh, uh, the new cycle is already moving on, unfortunately. And I think from the other thing that, um, and, and I think this is clear for Europeans as well. Um, so um, they're trying to find their own ways of, um, of addressing both security threats and then uh, in the long term um, economic issues as well with their own problems at home. The other thing that I think Europeans individually are looking at um, and, and would be in addition to what Samuel said, is um, that uh, we've seen the United States um, looking over the last few years and now increasingly for uh, military bases from a strategic point of view that are closer to Afghanistan with the United States losing its last base in, in Central Asia when was it 2014 or so. Um, 
there's um, there's now increased um, search for um, positionings of the um, U.S. military that would allow for even um, only drone um, surveillance or attacks uh, in Afghanistan. And so um, we've seen um, an increasing um, relationship that is potentially also um, in the development in the next few years, a higher development between the United States and um, Qatar and overall several Gulf um, states. But we also see movements, uh, similar movements in um, South um, Europe and in the uh, Mediterranean space, in the Eastern Mediterranean with Greece, um, with countries like Romania um, trying to make bids um, to, uh, to ensure more U.S. Uh, presence on the ground uh, in light of Afghanistan and uh, looking into the future in, to a more reduced U.S. presence on the ground overall. Last question, and I think it's unfair to ask uh, an Afghan what it is they expect, uh, or not what it is they would like the United States to do, but what might be a, f a fair question is is there what do the afghans expect the united states to do and what do they fear or want most in a way well uh, master the the decision space in the decision tree for the united states for washington is vast and the the options are also limitless but you know as for you know the united states future engagement in afghanistan as it determines uh, its mission space in, in, that, in that country, um, not everything uh, should be seen from that you know great powers competitions uh, perspective. Uh, as 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 the United States uh, is is engaged uh, uh, in uh, right now, like with the Chinese and others, you know, so not everything needs to be seen from that sort of burden shifting perspective to the region. Uh, there is a great deal that the United States could do by itself as well, because. When, when we engage in that sort of burden shifting, um, uh, we, we, we will find that uh, we may not find willing partners to, to take some of those responsibilities. So uh, instead of burden shifting, there has to be some kind of a burden sharing. Um, now, uh, you know, they have done it uh, and maybe the Chinese are biting here and there and they're urging for some kind of a neutral, stable and inclusive Afghanistan under the Taliban. But it's also a very better choice for um, like for them and for uh, uh, others in that region. And I'm not sure they have the capability, uh, the resources, or even the willingness to substitute uh, the United States uh, presence in Afghanistan. Uh, now, um, I think what, what the United States can do after this, or Washington can do is to, you know, engage in some kind of a increased heightened level of uh, economic creativity, come up with some, you know, smart uh, economic uh, focused, humanitarian uh, system focus mechanism uh, that's that should be in place in country rather than in any of the regional countries. Now, uh, we also need to, the, the United States need to use its convening and convincing power to come up with some kind of a regional economic understanding on Afghanistan, uh, maybe some kind of a consensus between the Pakistanis, the Chinese, the Iranians, uh, the Turks, the Qataris. Um, so in, in not all of these countries actually see eye to eye. The, the last point I wanted to make would be with respect to Pakistan. You know, the, the United States no longer have the same, you know, degree of layers of layers of dependency as you used to on Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan's role, um, you know, in, in, in peace talks in Afghanistan up until now was quite ambiguous, but it's no longer ambiguous because they got their wish of turning Afghanistan into a pliant half state. Uh, now they own it. So uh, they are the de facto kingmakers in, in Afghanistan right now. So it is now the, the Pakistani decision uh, with, with the Taliban and their Haqqani clients to decide as to whether turn Afghanistan into a representative participatory country or into a path of a dead nation. Uh, so in many of the Gulf countries can help in instrumentalizing their strategic relationship with the Pakistan to push them uh, to, to basically do uh, uh, the latter. So uh, the United States could do a great deal in this respect, but the United States could also do a great deal with respect to the Taliban as to pushing them uh, to begin resisting uh, the you know selling the Pakistani version of commercial Islam, which no longer applies because the U.S. and NATO forces have left the country. So um, uh, I think uh, that that'll be important. And then uh, uh, yeah, I'll stop it there.
Well, thank you all very much. It has been a fascinating discussion and it raises more questions about the future than anything it might have answered. Thank you again. Uh, very well, we, sorry, uh, Professor Bahir had to drop off. Uh, Samuel, Yulia, Javed, uh, you've been wonderful for uh, enlightening us. Thanks, sir.